Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Jefferson Hour. We do appreciate it. And also, we have to take a moment to thank those of you who have decided to support the show. Uh, We really appreciate it. We need it. And we use it judiciously. We're glad for your support. Uh, We take no personal uh, income or stipend from what we do. Uh, All of your contributions uh, help perpetuate this uh, conversation that we're having about about America, and although it's anchored in in the life of Thomas Jefferson and in the era of the founding of the country, the the early national period, that's not fundamentally what the Jefferson Hour is about. It's about civility, uh, careful argumentation, uh, playfulness, um, a a realization that the past is prologue, that we have a unique destiny here uh, in the United States, which is in some jeopardy at the current time. And so we, the letters that we get, David, are are wonderful. But the ones that I love most are are those that say, "This is a kind of an island of civility in a world of uh, partisan bickering." And I really hope that that is the style that we present to our listeners. And now we're having a couple of new series in the program. Well, you you walked right into that the the partisan bickering. That's what the conversation is sort of about this week and uh, just to set it up for people is it's a one-on-one. You have the opportunity because of what you do to have uh interviews that are are one-on-one with with uh, noted authors and others. And and this week uh, you shared a, a, a great conversation between you and the author H.W. Brands. Yes, this one-on-one series comes out of some work that I'm doing for Governing Magazine, which is headquartered in Sacramento. I have articles there and interviews, and uh, they've asked me to uh, initiate a, a program called Listening to America, where we're trying to get away from the kind of uh, brick bats an ad hominem of, of major media and look at this country with a less um, intense um, focus. And so I've been able to interview a, a relatively large number of extraordinary writers. And we've decided that we you know we ought to share the fruits of that with our friends here at the Jefferson Hour. So the one-on-one series will continue. And, and as you know, David, we've also started a second series, the 10 Things series with our friend, Dr. Lindsay Chervinsky. So new things are happening at the Jefferson Center. That's very exciting to you and to me. And I so appreciate your going through these interviews, which sometimes last an hour and a half. <laughs> well, with that, sir, shall we go to this week's show? Yes, just one more thing. Uh, there are still a few places in the Steinbeck Cultural Retreat. I'm actually on my way to San Jose tomorrow, David. So uh, the, the Steinbeck um, uh, Retreat is in the Monterey Peninsula in March. It's absolutely a wonderful time just for the dining and the scenery. But then we spend the mornings talking about a number of Steinbeck's books. And the afternoons are all field trips around uh, that world of Salinas and Monterey. So there are a few places left. I hope people will sign up for it. It's really uh, a wonderful way to spend a, a week in March in California. So with that, thanks to everyone for listening. Uh, I hope you'll let us know what you think of our one-on-one series and also our 10 Things series with Lindsay Chervinsky, uh, growth and interesting new innovations here at the Jefferson Hour, David. Very good. Let's go to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week on the Jefferson Hour, we present a one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson, the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and the author H.W. Brands. Brands is an American historian who has authored 30 books on U.S. history, and his works have twice been selected as finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. The two gentlemen discuss Brands' latest book titled Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists, in the American Revolution. All right, so what led you to write this book um, of the, what, now almost 40 that you've written? Well, uh, a number of things. In the first place, I teach American history, and so I've been fully aware of the American Revolution. Every, every autumn, I try to explain to my students what the American Revolution was about. 
And every autumn, I have to sort of remind myself of what it was about. And one of the lessons that I continually impress upon my students, more precisely, what I try to get my students to realize is that history is always more complicated than they thought. And I, one of the things I say is, history is more complicated than you think. Regardless of how complicated you think it is, it's more complicated than that. And, and so I know that my students are aware of the one-line description of the American Revolution. Americans get fed up with the British, they declare independence and win the war against Britain, and there it is. But I point out that it's, no, it's not as simple as that. So it's part of my sort of long-term endeavor with my students and my readers too, to remind them that things are more complicated than they often seem at first glance. Now, I'll acknowledge that to some people, that's not very satisfactory. They, they, go, to the, they go to the past, they go to history, for simple answers, in many cases, unfortunately, answers that will support their preconceptions. And I try to explain, no, it's not that way. That life in the past was just as complicated as life today. Now for me, and I'll be the first to own up to this, for me, that makes it all the more interesting. I love all the layers that the onion has. And you know, the more layers that peel off and the more complicated it gets, the better. Um, but not everybody shares that view. So I'll acknowledge that to begin with. But I insist on my, to my students that they be aware of that, whether they like it or not. I mean, I, I try to engage in the history and make them think that history is interesting. Um, and I would say a lot respond sometimes beside themselves. One of the classes that I teach, my biggest class is a required class of all undergraduates. And the great majority of my students are not history majors and don't intend to be and come into the class thinking that history is boring. And then I wind up you know, telling them stories. And well, everybody likes stories. You know this, Clay, you know, great storyteller. And so people love to hear stories. And my chemistry majors and the engineers, you know, they're used to classes being you know, straightforward, kind of cut and dried, and really kind of boring. And then they come in and just, okay, listen to the stories. So it has that connection to it. And, and I happen to think that stories are more interesting the more complicated they are. So that's part of it. The other part is that I had just written a book on John Brown and Abraham Lincoln and the run-up to the American Civil War, the one in the 1860s. And the thing that, the question that motivated that book was, what does a good person do in the face of evil? And so with John Brown and Abraham Lincoln, they agree that slavery is evil. But the operative question is, what are you going to do about it? And so that's the one that I explore. Well, looking at the differences of opinion regarding the American Civil War, the differences of opinion as they evolved on slavery, it may be, you know, we historians, we have this sort of uh, chronic occupational affliction of regression. We keep looking back to the past, and then when we get to the past, we can look back, well, what gave rise to that? What gave rise to that? So I asked myself, you know, when did people have to first make these decisions? And, and so the, the, the decision that I formulated for looking at the American Revolution is, what causes a person to forsake his country and take up arms against it? And this is a really big deal. It's called treason. And, and people throw around the term, I think, a bit too loosely, treason regarding the American Civil War. In fact, nobody was convicted of treason. It, it was insurrection. It was a different thing. But in the case of the American revolutionaries of the 1770s and 80s, this was treason under British law. So it's a big deal. And so what made them do it? And the question as well is what made other people not make that decision? Because going back to that one line description of the American Revolution, Americans get fed up with the British. Well, not all of them got fed up with the British. And that's the, to me, the intriguing part. So what caused some people to choose the course of revolution and others not? And in telling the story, and I, again, when I convey this to my classes, but to my readers as well, I think it's really important for anybody going back to the past to leave hindsight at the door. Because if you know how it turned out, then there's no way you can get inside the heads of the people you're trying to understand. And to me, that's the big thing. To me, it's what did the world look like to them? And in some respects, to me, 
history, or at least an examination of history, is almost like reading a novel. In the case of a novel, things are made up, but the point of a novel is to inhabit somebody else's world and see what the world looks like to that person. Well, I try to do the same thing with history, and we historians all do it to one degree or another, but I really try to make the world of George Washington come alive, and of Benjamin Franklin, and of William Franklin, and of Joseph Galloway, and of Benedict Arnold, and the several other people that I focus on in this book. And so why did some of them choose independence? Why did some of them choose loyalism? And one of the points that I try to get across is, again, if you know how it turned out, from our perspective in the year 2021, we know how it turned out. And so Anytime you know how it turned out, there is a certain kind of inevitability that tends to creep in to one's perception of this. And so without thinking very carefully about it, it's, it's say, well, of course, George Washington's going to become a rebel. And of course, Benjamin Franklin's going to become a rebel. But if you stop for a minute, you say, wait, there's no of course about it at all. Because rebellion, revolution, this is, uh, this is a rejection of the status quo. And the people who reject the status quo are usually people for whom the status quo isn't working very well. And in the case of Washington and Franklin, they couldn't ask for more from the status quo. So what is it that causes them to do this? And so when we know how it turned out, when we just have sort of the conventional view of the American Revolution, the thing that needs explaining is, wait, why didn't everybody join that bandwagon? I think that has the question backwards. The question is, why did anybody join that bad rank, especially people like this. And this comes out in the experience of William Franklin, the son of Benjamin Franklin, who was a loyalist. And sometimes I say, who became a loyalist. So this is the key. They didn't become loyalists. They were loyalists. They remained loyalists. The change, the big leap was made by the ones who chose revolution. You know, if anybody has some explaining to do, it's George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. It's not the loyalists, William Franklin, you know, Joseph Galloway, Thomas Hutchinson, and the like. I'm, I'm not deliberately trying to turn understanding of this on its head. I'm just trying to remind people that it wasn't as straightforward as it often has taken to be. Uh, lots there. So, I mean, if just take the Lewis and Clark story, for, for example. We know how it comes out. If you go into writing about it, knowing how it's going to come out, you lose much of the most extraordinary drama of the story because they didn't know how it was going to come out on any given day. And so and exactly. we, need and that's to, a, we need to reinvigorate that, right? And with the case of Lewis and Clark, one of the fascinating things to me is how they essentially fell off the face of the earth for a year and a half. And nobody knew where they were. It was easy to assume they were dead and they'd never be heard from again. Maybe their bodies would wash up at some point. And then, boom, you know, hey, we did it. And, yeah. and to go back to that moment of uncertainty where Jefferson, what became of him? And he so, even says, you know, in his usual Jeffersonian way, when Lewis writes to him, he says, your absence had begun to be felt. And he always <laughs> puts it in that kind of middle voice. Jefferson never wanted right. to take a full voice. Right. But, and, and, and one person in St. Louis who was a traveler um, whose diary is often quoted said they looked like um, refugees from Robinson Crusoe when they finally right. draggled their way in, you know? Yeah. So, all right. But if there's a story that line that you follow through this entire book, and there are many, but the one is Franklin and Son. And right. it's a beautiful story. It's a sad story and a complex story. But at the end, there's kind of a heartbreaking moment in your book where William reaches out to his father and says, can't we let this go? It's over now. We each made our choices. We're both men of integrity. And um, as you know, Benjamin Franklin writes back a letter in which he throws away some sort of reconciliation in the first paragraph, but then goes on into a blistering critique of his son. Talk about that. Well, so this is one of the challenges to people who study Benjamin Franklin, I think in particular, at least it's a challenge to me. And 20 years ago, I wrote a biography of Benjamin Franklin. And so I was first exposed to this and, and tried to puzzle this out. And one of the reasons that I find it such a challenge is that Franklin is a charming fellow. And I go out of my way when I'm writing about individuals in the past, not to get charm. I don't want to I don't want to like these people. I don't want to dislike them. I just want to keep them at arm's length so I can 
look at what they do and to convey that That's as dispassionately as possible. Historiographical strategy that you are not going to let them get in. Right, right. And I'll be the first to admit that this might not be the best decision uh, commercially because David McCulloch has demonstrated that if you like your subject and you show that you like your subject, you can write great stuff. And David McCulloch writes great stuff. It's a very different style though, that, than I'm aiming for. But, and, and I'll tell you, and, and I think you can appreciate this knowing Theodore Roosevelt as you do, I didn't have that much trouble keeping Roosevelt at arm's length, or more precisely, I knew I had to keep him at arm's length because otherwise he'd just sort of overwhelm you. You know, as Henry Adams used to say, coming back from the White House, you had to wring Roosevelt from your clothes. Roosevelt's style was pretty much in your face. You know, he had to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. Well, Franklin had a much more subtle charm and it was almost impossible not to be drawn in. There were moments, though, when the world didn't seem so under his control. Most of the time, he seemed to have things under control. And that was one of the things that was charming about him. But there were moments when, I, I hesitate to say the mask slipped, but there was something indicating that there was deeper stuff going on with Benjamin Franklin. You're listening to a special one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and the author H.W. Brands. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We now rejoin our special one-on-one conversation with Clay Jenkinson and the author H.W. Brands as they discuss the character of Benjamin Franklin. But there were moments when, I, I hesitate to say the mask slipped, but there was something indicating that there was deeper stuff going on with Benjamin Franklin. And one of those moments, or more precisely, an aspect of his life was his relationship with his family. as eminent an individual as Benjamin Franklin was, he was no poster child for good family relations. And he essentially abandoned his wife uh, to go live in London. And he, he wished, or he said he wished that she would come join him, but she wouldn't. And so he just stayed in London, basically. And then with William, with William, it was okay, uh, illegitimate child. And there was a difficulty of the stepkid, stepmom relationship in the family. But they got over that. William defied his son to run off and join the army. Franklin thought that was a bad idea, but Franklin was in no position to criticize here because he ran away from home at the same age. And then they, they seemed to reconcile as adults and they were friends and they were professional associates. Uh, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin helped further William Franklin's career. And they seem to be getting along all right until the revolution breaks out. And it requires this big decision. And in contradiction to the standard situation in families, at least as one normally considers it, um, usually it's the younger generation that is more rebellious. In this case, it was Benjamin Franklin at the age of 70 who becomes this rebel. And his son says, let's stick with the status quo. And Franklin almost sort of, apparently without reflecting on it, assumed that his son owed it to him, the father, to follow him basically out of the empire. And he just never quite got over that, which is striking because during the Revolutionary War, Franklin fell out, became estranged from many of his friends in Britain. But once the war was over, okay, the war's over, we've gone our separate ways, now we're an independent country and we can deal with this like adults. And in nearly every case, he sort of repaired those old relationships. But in the case of William, he couldn't or he wouldn't do it. And he said that he was so wounded by William's actions during the war. Well, William's actions consisted of upholding his oath of office, his oath of allegiance to the British government. If anybody, you know, had taken the break, if anybody might have felt wounded, it could have been William saying this about his father. And the fact that after the war was over, 
Benjamin Franklin could not reconcile with his son. I really found that hard to fathom. I just can't imagine, and it made me question, it made me question at the end of my long biography of Benjamin Franklin, whether I really understood the guy at all. But it's one of the intriguing aspects of history. But it's a reminder in this particular book about how the American Revolution split communities, split states, split an empire, and split families, how sort of close to the heart many of these questions were. And it is, a stri it is a striking thing because when we talk about the Civil War of the 1860s, yes, it split a country, and to some degree it split states, um, West Virginia from Virginia and so on. But for the most part, it was geographically contained. So if you were in one of the 11 seceded states, okay, pretty much everybody around you was a Confederate, or at least they really keep their mouths shut. But in the case of the American Revolution, there were loyalists and patriots everywhere. And it was true that New York City became a loyalist haven after the British occupied it, the British army occupied it and made it their headquarters. And it is true that loyalism was strong in some of the Southern states or colonies as the British still looked on them. But for the rest, they were mixed all over the place. And one of the things that made the war so difficult was that you never knew when you were talking to a stranger, if you were talking to somebody who agreed with you or not. So, and this is one of the things that I bring out when I deal with various of the people, including Grace Galloway, who was the wife of Joseph Galloway. And she, after he, I'm not going to say he absconded, he left with the British after the British evacuated Philadelphia. He was a, a prominent loyalist. And then he eventually went off to England, leaving Grace behind to try to save the, the family property. He took the daughter, didn't he? And took the daughter. And took he the daughter. the daughter exactly. away, maybe forever, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it was because Grace died before anybody came back. Oh. And, and so Grace is finding herself. So she, she has been a strong loyalist. And as long as the British army was occupying Philadelphia, everybody in Philadelphia seemed to be a loyalist. But then after the army left and the Continental Army comes back and retakes the place, then, <laughs> then all the loyalists are running for cover. And so Grace is trying to make ends meet. She's trying to, she's talking to old friends, but old friends don't want to talk to her because she was too visibly a loyalist. And she finds herself asking when she sees somebody, can I even say anything to that person? Because will I be accused of being a loyalist? So it was a harrowing time. It was a harrowing time for the Patriots as well, but because they eventually won, then we say, okay, you know, that was in the service of independence. For the loyalists, it was harrowing and they lost and they didn't have anything to show for it afterwards. And as you say, 50,000 eventually left after the war. But looking at Galloway, this has really raised a question for me about your method and, and your research and how you do this, because of course it's a giant subject and you could have written a book four times that long had you chosen to. How do you, you know, and, and, and her story is particularly fascinating to me because she's essentially abandoned. She winds up living in that kind of back street slum, sharing an apartment, yeah. can't even put food on the table, is reduced almost to begging. She then becomes a kind of she turns on her husband and says, well, he was always kind of a schnook and she, be, she becomes kind of angry. How did you discover that and how do you choose what to feature? Well, as a historian yourself, I think you can appreciate that we, we look for good sources. And if the sources aren't there, unlike the novelists, including the historical novelists, if the sources aren't there, we can't write about them. We can conjecture a little bit, but you can't carry the story. And as I said earlier, one of the things that I really try to do is to get inside the heads of historical figures and bring and let my readers, in the case of a book, let my readers sort of inhabit the world. So if I find somebody who left a memoir, as Grace Galloway did, in fact, she was the reason I chose Joseph Galloway. Right. Because, okay, I've got this source. And you know, it's in the nature of history for that period that more of the voices are male voices. And so when you find a good woman's voice who has a compelling story, and I think her story is actually more compelling than her husband's is, but in order to set it up, she was a loyalist in large part because her husband was a loyalist. To put it another way, 
it would have been very difficult for her to take a different political position from her husband. But yeah, so one of the fascinating things about Grace Galloway is that although she refuses to declare independence from Britain, in effect, she declares independence from her husband and concludes that, you know, that this marriage, this wasn't so good. And now it's better that he's across an ocean. One of the things that I do with my students is I draw a distinction between what I call big history and little history. So big history is the overarching story. It's the American Revolution. It's you know war and peace. It's all this other stuff. Little history is a story of individual lives. And for me, the most interesting part is the intersection of these two. And so Grace Galloway, as I say, the, she remains politically loyal to her king, but her loyalty to her husband dissolves as, after he takes off. And then you raise... A, a really good point about what happened to the loyalists after the war. They had to leave. And this, this gets at the question of why, why we don't know more about the loyalists. Why are they, why they're not, why are they not part of our public consciousness? And the answer is because, and this was a good thing for them, they had a place to go. The worst thing that can happen is if you're involved in a revolution and you don't have a place to go. And when you don't have a place to go, then things get really bloody. And so you see this in the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, various other revolutions. But one of the reasons that it didn't happen in the case of the United States is not that Americans were particularly more genteel than others, but the loyalists all fled for their lives. And the British allowed them to come along. The British gave them a place to go. My book was long finished. It was at the printer when the end of the American war in Afghanistan occurred this last summer. But when I was watching on television and reading about the, the desperation of Afghans who had sided with the United States during the war and what was going to happen to them, would they be able to get out? They were clambering on board. They were clinging to the airplanes as they left. It really put me in mind of the evacuation of New York City at the end of the American Revolution, because clearly the British were leaving. And then the question was, who are they going to take with them? Who's going to get to leave and where will they go? And so this is a perennial question. Wars almost always end messily. And it's often tempting to just you know, stop your story at the end of the war and say, okay, no, but in this case, much of my story is what happens to these people? And the answer is nothing good with a couple of exceptions. So part of the story, and one of, the, one of the points that I make in the book is that everybody had to decide. So they had to decide whose side are you on? Now, for some, the choice was relatively unconstrained. So Benjamin Franklin, he could make his choice, even William Franklin, despite the family expectations. But for enslaved people, for example, or for Grace Galloway, a woman, it's, it was harder for a woman to make an independent decision. It was even harder for the enslaved peoples. But fortunately for me, there are a couple of individuals who wrote memoirs of their experience. And one, again, this is for, perfect for me, one of them was Boston King, yeah. um, an enslaved man who became a patriot. So, I mean, excuse me, he became a loyalist. He, so in response to an offer by the British government to turn coat to, this was an offer that only applied to the slaves of patriot masters. If you leave your master and come over to the British side of the lines and help us suppress the revolution, then we'll give you your freedom. And Boston King, this man, took up the offer. Now, as with anybody making the choice you have to weigh, so what are your chances of success? You know, um, there are principles involved here. Where do you stand on the principles? Where does your personal interest lie? What are the chances of success? What happens if your side wins? What happens if your side loses? And so on. In the case of Boston King and other enslaved peoples who had to make this decision, it was more fraught because even if the British side won, would they actually follow through on their promise, because slavery was still legal in the British Empire. Uh, and so this is something you had to see. So Boston King joins the British Army, and he marches around, and he sails around on boats, and he finally finds himself in New York City. 
at the end of the war. And he hears that as a result of the negotiations in Paris by Benjamin Franklin, among others, the British have agreed at the end of the war to return confiscated property. And people like Boston King knew that the Americans considered slaves to be property, so that, oh my gosh, the British are going to give us up. But this is one of those cases where there was enough wiggle room in the, the negotiations, in the terms, so that the British did give back horses and houses and buildings and things like that, but they didn't give back the slaves. And in fact, so they provided transport for most of the slaves, at least the ones who were in New York and other conveniently located places. And so Boston King went off to Canada and he lived to Canada as a free man. And he eventually went to England and then he wound up in Sierra Leone, the British colony in West Africa. So it's a place to put freed peoples. Um, another individual, like as another slave, whose name was Jeffrey Brace. And Brace is a patriot slave fighting on the patriot side and in his case his decision was less a conscious decision um, it's just his patriot master went to war and said you're coming along with me now jeffrey brace presumably could have made the same kind of decision that boston king did but in a theater of war these decisions depended a whole lot on where the front line was located. How far did you have to travel across? Well, in this case, it would have been enemy territory if you're switching sides. And so Jeffrey Brace just goes on and he fights on behalf of the Patriots' sides, on behalf of independence. But he's he fully. He makes that sentence, right, where he says, Here I am, a slave fighting for the freedom of people who enslave me. Exactly, exactly. He understands the irony of this. If the side that I'm fighting for wins, I've basically nailed my chains even tighter. But in his case, it also has something of a happy ending because at the end of the war, his master said, basically, you've done such a good job fighting. Here's your freedom. And so he becomes a free man. But several thousand um, enslaved people went to the British lines in one form or another. Right. And yeah. the British, although they didn't return enslaved people, Sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. And and, right. and the person who made this decision had to realize that the downside is going to be very, very severe. In other words, reprisal. If you escape from your plantation near Williamsburg and you're and you're returned to your owner at some point, that's not going to be like an amnesty. Right, right. There's no amnesty and there's not going to be a, oh, well, let's just forget about it sort of thing. You're you're right about that. And another group for whom the question was fraught were the Native American peoples. Now, they had been in the habit of having to make choices between the different combatants among the Europeans and their descendants in North America. They, In particular, in the American colonies, they'd been choosing between the French and the British for 100 years since the late 17th century. And they always had to make a decision, again, based on who they think is going to win, and what's going to be the policy of the side that they join if that side wins, again, what happens if they lose, and so on. And again, there were personal elements as well. So an individual that I focus on is a man who was called by the English and the Americans, Joseph Brandt. He was a leader of the, the Mohawks, um, one of the constituent parts of the Iroquois Confederacy. And Joseph Brandt had a, a very good personal relationship with a man named William Johnson, who was essentially the Indian agent for the British Empire in that part of New York. And, and it was influenced partly by that, again, referring to sort of what I call the, the little history, this personal connection. But it was also a case that Brandt realized, or at least he concluded, that the worst thing that would happen for the Mohawks, and presumably for other Indian tribes as well, is if the Americans won their independence, because the British government was acting as a restraining force upon Western settlement. In fact, the British decision to forbid new settlements west of the Appalachians was one of the distant causes of the American Revolution, the Proclamation of 1763. And so Brandt realized that the Indian peoples would be better off if there remained a balance of power among the various white folks, as there had been between the British and the French. 
And so everybody loved him, even though he'd been on the wrong side during the war. So that's a striking thing where this is, I think, characteristic of civil wars generally, that they're most bitter among the people who are closest. So Benjamin Franklin could not forgive his son, William, but lots of people could forgive Joseph Brandt because there wasn't really anything personal there. It was just, ah, just this political difference. We can get over that. You're listening to a special one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and best-selling historian and Pulitzer Prize finalist H.W. Brands. They discuss Brands' new book, Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We continue our one-on-one conversation between Clay Jenkinson and the author H.W. Brand about his new book, Our First Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. Back to slavery for just a minute. I I read your book on on a device and and I outlined in blue, shaded in blue, every time one of the patriots talked about, if uh, we don't win this war, then we're mere slaves. They're trying to enslave us. They're going to re-enslave us. What do they think we are? Nothing but slaves. And I know you do that deliberately, but given where we are culturally at the moment, you can't read this stuff anymore without just cringing every time you come to it, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's quite true. And I thought it's particularly rich when George Washington uses this terminology all the time. We are going to become slaves. George Washington, nobody's enslaving you, for heaven's sakes. You're always going to be the wealthiest person in Virginia. You're always going to be one of the most respect. On the Virginia social pyramid, you're always going to be at the top. No one's going to whip you if you lose. Precisely. And so one has to decide, is this just an overwrought figure of speech? Or is there something serious going on here? And I think that the appropriate sort of first assumption is that they mean what they say. So what does he mean by this? Well, in the first place, it means that he recognizes that his liberties are at risk. This is, this is Washington. He's thinking about this. Now, which liberties? Again, he's not going to get whipped. He's not going to be sold down the river or anything like that. But he thinks that rights that he ought to have are going to be taken from him. And he's thinking, well, again, it's going to be something of a slippery slope. Again, he's not going to wind up in the slave quarters on Mount Vernon, but the imagery is there. And it also, when sort of projected in a different direction, it makes us reflect on, so what did Thomas Jefferson mean when he said all men are created equal? Because he certainly didn't mean at that time and place, everybody had equal political rights. Um, But so he's talking about something else. But it's a reminder, again, that people looked upon rights in quite a different way than we look upon rights today. In fact, the concept of human rights was quite a novelty. Indeed, it was revolutionary. And that's why it was in the Declaration of Independence, that there are natural rights that humans have. But for most people in the world at the time, humans didn't have rights. Maybe English men had rights, but simply because they were English men and French people didn't have English rights. And what the Americans and the British were really arguing about is whether the Americans had English rights. And so one of the things that has happened in the last two and a half centuries, and we're coming up in five years, on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence is this expansion of the notion of human rights. But in, as I say, in the 1770s, the concept that humans had rights simply because they were humans was very foreign to most people. It was a different world. And it's, again, knowing how things turned out over the next 200 years, we can see, wait, there seems to be, there's got to be some cognitive dissonance going on here. But one of the striking things about Washington is he didn't, the contradiction did not seem apparent to him, as far as I can tell. Now, for somebody like Jefferson, Jefferson was more of a reflective type. And Jefferson, of course, he lived longer than Washington. And by the Missouri Compromise of 1820, by the last years of Jefferson's life, he was fully aware of what this 
fundamental contradiction within American republicanism was costing. The contradiction basically between the Declaration of Independence, which says all people are equal, and the Constitution, which says, well, except for slaves, and they can be classed as property. I, I take the distinction between Jefferson and Washington, but when Washington will write that sort of thing, you will, you would expect him to sort of at that point lift his pen and think, hmm, slave, I own slaves. I wonder what these things, did these speak to each other in any way? But you're saying that he wasn't a hypocrite, although we could see him as one, and he wasn't he, he wasn't aware of the contradiction here, that, that these were separate ways of thinking. Well, I think it would have been similar to somebody saying that, George Washington, you are not equally represented in British Parliament. And he would say, that's an affront. But George, Martha doesn't get to vote. And he would say, well, she's a different category of person. It doesn't right. apply to her. With a man like Jefferson, who's so reflective, I always look for the fallout. Where's the fallout? Where's the cognitive fallout from this inconsistency at the center of his life? And you don't, you can't find one. It, 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 Jefferson appears to have been able to live cheerfully with these these categories that you're talking about, and they didn't bleed over to 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 cost him much sleep. The thing that Jefferson actually did say that he lost sleep over because it struck him like a fire bell in the night this, this was, compromise. was precisely what slavery was doing to the American Republic. And the particular aspect of the Missouri Compromise, the one that gave him this alarm was the drawing of this geographic line, because he understood that once you draw a line on the map, then you essentially invite a division of the Union. Because I mentioned earlier that unlike the Civil War of the 1860s, where there was this geographic dividing line in what I called our first civil war in the American Revolution, there was no clear-cut geographic dividing line. There were patriots and loyalists everywhere. And so there was it was a different thing. But the thing that Jefferson regretted, he didn't, I, I don't think Jefferson ever felt himself personally culpable in terms of slavery. He did feel that America, he wouldn't have used the term culpable, but he realized that the United States had gotten itself into this fix. And the fix was to allow the existence of slavery within a republic, because there are two sets of values here that are quite diametrically opposed. And he knew this was going to lead to trouble. Now, this is one of the reasons that Jefferson wrote this scathing condemnation of Britain in the Declaration of Independence for imposing slavery on the American colonies. Now, he really protests too much. It's not as though the British you know, put a gun to the head of the Virginians and say, here, you're going to buy these slaves. But what Jefferson imagined was, boy, we would have been able to make a much more effective case for republicanism if we didn't have these slaves. And we and wish they weren't If I don't have here. this paragraph, this is going to be a harder document to justify. That I think that paragraph is in there to say, we're not unaware of this. Right, so. exactly. But of course, it was the representatives primarily from Georgia and South Carolina who said, you know, don't take on slavery because you're going to have trouble with this. And so, but, but Jefferson understood this. Now, actually, Washington did too. And both Washington and Jefferson, and in fact, it's fair to say very many, I might even go so far as to say most slave owners in the 1770s and 1780s believed that slavery was a bad thing. And maybe they, on the way out. And on the way out, yes, indeed. Before the cotton so, Precisely. And in fact, so slavery was a bad thing, but as far as they could tell, it was necessary for running the Southern economy, as long as the economy depended on tobacco. And George Washington began to shift out of the culture of tobacco and Mount Vernon and his other properties because tobacco wore out the soil. And so nobody yet had figured out how to grow cotton economically. Now, they did once Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, and all of a sudden that changed things. But people like Washington could imagine that slavery was on its way out. It was going to die under its own weight. And there was a model for this, the emancipation of slaves, the ending of slavery in the northern states. Because the northern states by 1800, Washington died in 1799. So by then, slavery was gone or going in all of the northern states. And it's not because northerners were afflicted by a fit of morality 
it was that their economies were changing in a way that made the inflexibility of slavery of a cost rather than a benefit. And, and so when you grow wheat, if you grow wheat in Pennsylvania, when you grow wheat, you plow the field and plant the seeds, and that takes two weeks, and then you walk away and come back five months later, and you spend two weeks harvesting it. Well, the last thing you want is to be burdened from the, the slave master's point of view with supporting the slaves during all that. You want to be able to hire and let them go. Now, tobacco wasn't that way. Tobacco requires a great deal of cultivation, and so did cotton once cotton came along. Um, but it was possible for Jefferson and Washington to believe that, for example, at the Constitutional Convention, they got a future ban on the slave trade, the importation of, of slaves across the Atlantic. They got a ban that was everybody understood was going to take effect in 1808 because they were thinking that, okay, we can't get rid of the people of African descent who are already here, but we don't need to increase their numbers so we can stop that. And then, and then we'll sort of, slavery will die in the South the way it died in the North. But one of the things that they could not figure out, and it was basically, what are we going to do with the slaves? I mean, what are we going to do with the former slaves, even if we should free them? And Jefferson pointed out that he himself didn't know because he recognized the, the evils, the crimes that had been committed on all of these slaves. And he said, it is in, not humanly possible for them to forgive the injuries they have suffered at our hands. A legacy of race tension forever, essentially. Precisely. And, you know, and this is the case even all the way down to Abraham Lincoln, because Lincoln is trying to figure out, okay, you know, Lincoln is still in that first generation of American democracy where ordinary people get to exercise political opinion. Well, it's hard enough with people who are of the same race and background, all this. How are we going to do this if we have these people of a different race background, and furthermore, that we've oppressed for these 250 years. You know, what do we do about this? And he certainly had a point because in 1850 and 1860, there was no example of a successful biracial society where there was equality among the races. And it's arguable whether any such thing exists even today. And I think the jury is in some limited respect still out on this. Yeah, but Jefferson, yeah. Jefferson was right in a certain sense. He said, if I understand the republic correctly, the idea of a biracial republic is probably a contradiction in terms. Yeah. Um, that the, the differences are just too fundamental. And, a, and as you say, with especially with the magnifier effect of the founding relationship in slavery, yeah. that, that maybe if we hadn't had that relationship, but this just can't work. And so he's a repatriationist, as is Lincoln in some moods. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're straying from your book, uh, but it's great. I want to ask you about your strategies as a historian. So you produce and you've written a biography of, of uh, Franklin, which I've read. This is the sternest portrayal of Franklin that I've ever read. You make him an arguer. He's, he's a strong arguer against the British people that he uh, the agents that he's working with. In the Paris um, negotiations that led to the settlement of the war, he's strong, you know. And the usual, and that's a kind of a counter to our normal view of this genial raconteur who just wants to have another glass of wine and flirt with French ladies, and that he'll tell a funny story, but he never wants to be in controversy. That's how Jefferson saw him. But you've portrayed a sterner, more argumentative, more firm Franklin than I've ever seen before. Well, part of it is the, the particular slice of Franklin that I focus on in this book, because again, sort of the heart of my story is the motivating question is what causes somebody like Franklin to forsake his country and take arms against it. And so this was serious stuff. It's because, of course, I couldn't tell the whole Franklin story, and I already done that. The charm gets left aside because when Franklin is dealing with the British, he's not charming. He's all business. It's when he's trying to flatter the French and you know all that stuff. Or and talk Jefferson off the ledge at the declaration the, moment. You know. Right, exactly. So it's it's all I would say all the the humanizing stories of Franklin 
they're not especially germane to this story. But the other reason is, so that was sort of by happenstance, but the other part of it is that I really wanted to get at kind of the stern core of this story because it's not a happy story. You know, it's uplifted if it's uplifting if you take the side of the patriots and they win and America becomes this independent going concern. But I'm sort of I want to remind readers that there is this tragedy involved. And the tragedy is for the ones who lose. And they were well, I guess I was about to say they were as American as the other ones, but I mean, that's part of part of the difference that Benjamin Franklin was born an Englishman and died an American. William Franklin was born an Englishman and died an Englishman. And so he didn't change that identity. And that's, that's one of the central questions that's involved in any sort of revolutionary movement. There's, who are you? And it's also a reminder that this American Revolution was not like the French Revolution. It was, I mean, it was revolutionary in a certain sense, but as much as anything, it was a war of national liberation. And in any war of national liberation, there are people who don't want to be liberated. Now, it, it sounds sort of unkind or pejorative against those people, what you don't want to be liberated. No, they just, they liked the government that they were living under. And one of the striking things about all of this is that the rights that Washington and Jefferson, Franklin, Adams, and all those sort of claim for Americans were essentially the rights that Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee claim for the Confederates. And even Lincoln acknowledged this. So when the Confederacy left, when they tried to leave the Union, they claimed that they had a constitutional right to leave. Lincoln said, you don't have a constitutional right to leave. You have a natural right to leave. There's a right of revolution, but you have to fight the revolution. You don't just get a free pass. And, and Grant agreed with this as well. And so Grant of course, led the Union Army to suppress the Southern Rebellion. But he acknowledged that if you believe in the right of self-government, if a large group of people conclude that the government they're living under does not suit their purposes, they have a right to try to change it. But they have to fight and they have to win. And if they lose, then they're stuck with it. And so this is, there's, if you sort of follow the mainstream of American thought, the good guys are the rebels in 1776, the rebels in 1861 are the bad guys. So how does this happen? And, you know, well, part of the argument is, well, they were rebelling over slavery. But as we said, and we were talking about the, the Patriots, George Washington owned slaves, Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. So it's uh, one, coming back to the original point, it's a complicated story. A fascinating one-on-one -on -one conversation Clay this week between you and the author H.W. Brands on a subject that uh, probably doesn't get enough attention, the loyalists in America during the Revolution. We're so very fortunate to be able to feature the great historian H.W. Brands on the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and there will be others in our one-on-one -on -one series. And Brands has written almost 40 books, David. Uh, he's extraordinarily prolific. His books are, are readable. Uh, he does impeccable research. Thanks so much, um, David, and, and to all of you who are listening, we'll see you next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>